Good evening, everybody. Hope everyone's having a happy hump day. So I'm going to put the Kahoot code on the in the chat and it's also on the screen and we're gonna give people time to log on. We have some competition today, Zahir. here. It's eight people already signed on. Let's see, because diabetes is near and dear to my heart. So let's see what we got today. It's a very important topic. Mm -hmm. The game is small. Is, is it going to show larger? It's, it's large on my screen. Maybe we'll, oh, okay. Is it better now? Ooh. It's something with my screen. I'll figure it out. Good evening, everyone. For those who are just joining us, we are going to be starting our Kahoot game very shortly. The code to play is on the screen. And I'm also dropping it in the chat as well. Yes, someone raised their hand. You have a question? You're muted. Good evening, how are you? Good evening, how are you? Good, good, quick question. So what exactly are we doing with the Kahoot pin? So Kahoot okay. is almost the same thing as uh, Jeopardy. It's, a, it's just a game. Okay. okay. And it's just uh, going to be a way to test and gauge everybody's knowledge about diabetes. Gotcha, okay. Mm -hmm. It's optional as well. So if you don't want to um, participate in this part, you don't have to. It's just like a little fun way we test at the beginning. Okay, so we're going to get started. And please, if you haven't had a chance to log on, the code is always going to be at the top of the screen, so you'll be able to find it. If you haven't had a chance to log on, you'll still be able to play. What is diabetes? Too little sugar in the blood or too much sugar in the blood? All right, yes, good job. Too much sugar in the blood. So we have Rody in, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, by the way, I wanna norm that. 
Rhodey in first place, we have Serenity in second, Lauren S in third, Kimberly in fourth, and Faiza in fifth. What is the scientific, scientific name for blood sugar? Glucose, plasma, red blood cells, or white blood cells? Yes, the correct answer is glucose. Okay. All right. I see we have some people coming through. Type 1 diabetes results from what organs failure to produce enough insulin? The liver, the kidney, the pancreas, or the stomach? Yes, Ms. Dorset. You're muted. Yes, we will. Um, it's, it's, it's not allowing me to answer the questions. Okay, so one thing to keep in mind is that on your screen is probably popping up as correlating, the words are correlating with the, with the, with the colors. Is that, is that the issue? When you're I try to- the words, so You're gonna see, only see the colors. I, I see the colors, but it's not allowing me to, to answer the questions. Well, it's, so, it's okay. It's just, it's just a game, okay. so you can feel free to drop just, the answers off. Just tap the, the color. It's, if you can, you're not able to tap it? No. No, I'm not. Okay. We got a hot streak in the okay. house. Rody's still holding on to first place. Go, girl. Symptoms of diabetes are... Increased urination, thirst, fatigue, or all of the above. All of the above, good job, everyone. Okay. If your doctor tells you that you have prediabetes, then you will develop diabetes later. True or false? Yes, the correct answer is false. If you are pre-diabetic, that means that you are at risk of becoming diabetic. But if you change your habits, it's possible for you to get on the right track. Okay, Lauren S is in the lead and Kimberly's coming through with the upset. You gonna let them take, you gonna let them have that, Rody? Type two diabetes requires life longer treatment to keep blood sugar levels within a target range, true or false? Yes, the correct answer is true. Type two diabetes requires lifelong treatment to keep blood sugars within a target range. Diabetes is a disease in which the body is unable to properly use and store glucose, true or false? The answer is true. Which condition is deficiency of glucose in the bloodstream? Hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia? The correct answer is hypoglycemia. We see you, Ms. Dorset, in the in the chat with the right answers. 
All right, we have Lauren S. still in the lead. The Shia, again, I apologize for I'm saying your name wrong, <laughs> is in second place. Destiny in third. Doc Shell is in fourth. And Jay in fifth. Okay. In 2018, non-Hispanic Blacks were twice as likely as non-Hispanic whites to die from diabetes. Is this true or false? Unfortunately, that is true. Diabetes disproportionately affects our Black community. Last question, everybody. What are complications of diabetes? Blindness, high blood pressure, neopathy. Anybody who's a doctor, please correct me. I said it wrong. Neuropathy. Or all are correct. Hmm? Neuropathy. I was about to say, we're going to need Stacy or Alicia or uh, Mr. Narche to go ahead and <laughs> give us that. Pronunciation. I was waiting on Stacy. All are correct. Good job, everybody. All right, so let's see who our winners are. We've got Destiny in third place. Lashia in second place. And... Lauren S. in first place. Okay, ladies, thank you all for playing. My three winners, please privately message me your email addresses so I can make sure you get your prize. Thank you all for playing. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us on tonight. Let me share my screen. Hold on, go back to the beginning. Let's talk about health and how research can fuel improved healthcare outcomes in the African American community. The conversation is very important and relevant because of increasing concern related to health disparities in the US. We are all aware of the many health disparities in the African-American community. However, today, in addition to discussing the alarming health disparities, I am happy to discuss a program that aims to be a part of the solution. The Dreff Research Matters for All of Us initiative funded by the NIH All of Us Research Program is working to decrease health disparities and gaps. These are the members of the citywide coordination team. The Delta Research and Educational Foundation is one of the national community engagement partners assisting the NIH, sorry, the NIH, all of us research program in its efforts to improve health for generations to come. Members of the DREF executive board, office staff, and the DREF Research Matters for all of us work together to ensure the effectiveness and success of this initiative. These are the 12 cities across the United States selected by NIH to have concentrated engagement efforts. As a result, DREF Research Matters for all of us citywide coordinators were selected and given the responsibility to lead local initiatives. Do you see your city on this screen? Yes. Well, here's our beautiful skyline. I'm happy to be a representative for Miami, Florida. And today we are talking about diabetes awareness. I am Lakeisha Morris Moreau. I am the new citywide coordinator for Miami, Florida. Thank you for joining us tonight. This presentation will focus on the needs of our community. The Delta Research Foundation, also known as DREF, was established by Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated in 1967. It is a major 501c3 nonprofit organization focused on supporting African-American women and their families. 
One of DREF's core missions involves in promoting, promoting health and wellness in the African-American community. The objective of the DREF Research Matters for All of Us initiative is to create awareness in the African-American community about the NIH All of Us Research Program and share the importance of participating in biomedical research. We are committed to encouraging health and wellness and dedicated to educate, educating the community about improving health outcomes. Please view this video to learn a little bit more about GIRF, our Research Matters for All of Us initiative and the NIH All of Us Research Program. So much of what we've done in medicine over the years has not really taken into account individual differences. And this is an opportunity to be part of something, something historic. Most studies and most clinical trials have always been with the average white male. So as we start thinking about this in the context of building trust, I think we get back that trust by involving the community. Not saying you come to us or we'll just do things to you. We're going to do things with you and in fact allow that information to be accessible to you, the individual. You're going to have some individuals that are going to say, yes, good, we're getting in on the ground level of a study. And then you're going to have those that have some trepidations about it. My thing is to bring them up aboard and let them know that this is for the greater good for them. We have input and, you know, without input, there's no buy-in. And without buy-in, there's no commitment. Without commitment, there's no success. Tuskegee happened. You know, we're not trying to hide that or sweep it under the rug, but communities of color will be at a disadvantage if we do not find ways to get by that. Whether the focus is asthma, whether the focus is infant mortality, whether the focus is diabetes, cancer or heart disease, communities of color are disproportionately impacted by them. It has always been playing catch up to make sure that they're even getting access, much less minimum service, low income, underserved, and people of color are oftentimes very generous in giving something if they understand it. And they always do so with the intention that knowing this is not just about me, this is not just even about my family, it is about helping the community down the road. Being able to bring the Asian American population who's never at the table, not only to contribute to science, but to contribute to our ability to understand the nuances within those populations. I think it will provide a huge huge national data set so we can ask questions and make discoveries about, about healthcare that will better their own personal health and those of the communities that they are a part of. Diversity, strength, as a science, it could bridge some civil rights issues and inequities in healthcare across all races and ethnicities and culture. As a community of color, underrepresented, hidden, underserved, what would happen if you were not at the table? It is an issue of equity, it's an issue of justice as well. It is important for minorities to be a part of this, or we will again be left with medications that are created for really other populations. I'm hopeful that we will be overwhelmed with both. As you can see from the video, we have been all about all of us, all of this time. In year five of the DREF Research Matters for All of Us outreach campaign, DREF is focusing a component of its outreach in 12 NIH selected communities. The DREF Research Matters for All of Us citywide coordinators will help to engage citizens of these cities about the NIH All of Us Research Matters program. We, along with the DREF Research Matters for All of Us core team, are conducting two monthly virtual DREF Matters programs. Events and our programs to educate our communities about the importance of participating in biomedical research. Additionally, we are partnering with community organizations to expand our reach and aim to educate about the NIH All of Us Research Program. This month, we are happy to partner with several community partners. But before we do that, I want to show you this video from our president, President Obama, regarding precision medicine. Something called precision medicine, in some cases people call it personalized medicine, gives us one of the greatest opportunities for new medical breakthroughs that we have ever seen. Doctors have always recognized that every patient is unique. Mm -hmm. 
And doctors have always tried to tailor their treatments as best they can to individuals. You can match a blood transfusion to a blood type. That was an important discovery. What if matching a cancer cure to our genetic code was just as easy, just as standard? What if figuring out the right dose of medicine was as simple as taking our temperature? And that's the promise of precision medicine, delivering the right treatments at the right time, every time, to the right person. Precision medicine is a new approach to improving health, treating disease, and finding cures. It acknowledges that each person is unique. Our genes, our environments, our lifestyles, our behaviors, and that the interaction of these factors greatly impact our health. These unique variables also mean that a medical treatment that works for one person might not work for the other. Rather than using cookie cutter, one size fits all approaches, precision medicine aims to deliver the right treatment for the right person at the right time. It also aims to keep people healthy longer. Ultimately, precision medicine can produce more accurate diagnoses, earlier detection, and better prevention strategies and treatment choices. Precision medicine is a radical shift in how each of us can receive the best care possible based on our own unique makeup. The NIH All of Us Research Program was created as a result of this precision medicine initiative. In our second webinar this month, we will take a deeper dive into NIH All of Us Research Program, discussing its core mission and invested return. Here you can see our mission and objectives. Our mission is to accelerate, to nurture relationships, to catalyze a robust ecosystem, deliver the largest and richest biomedical research ever. And we can only do that with the help of you all as we strive to enter 1 million people into the Research Matters for All of Us program. Here are our core values. We believe in being open and honest, having diversity. How can we talk about precision medicine if we don't want to have diversity? Engaging as many community partners as we possibly can, being open and transparent to make sure that we can engage you all and have the trust of our community have broad access, make this as accessible as possible to have as many people engaged as we can. Security and privacy, we will not share your information. You will be informed about it and you will own your healthcare information and make a positive change. That is what we are going to do. So you might want to know, how do I go about becoming a member of the Research Matters for All of Us program. And I'm so glad you asked. It's an easy process. We'll share an email with you very soon. You'll also hear from one of our partners, our health partners. Once you're enrolled, you'll go through an, a consent process and you will authorize the Research Matters program to have your information. You'll go in, you'll have surveys, there'll be physical measurements that you'll take, they'll have samples, and you can pick how you want to participate. If you're not comfortable with something, you can have that conversation with your health provider at the Research Matters program. Some things that you also might receive are digital apps and wearables that can track your health and your different behaviors and activities. And at the end of it, you have all of your information, your very own information, and that's invaluable, especially during this time where there's so many people that do not have health insurance or don't have adequate health care they can have a full review of their own personal health status. The questions that we might answer. We might answer how to develop better pain medications that aren't addictive. If you can remember from the video before, there was a young lady that talked about how most of the people that participate in these studies don't look like us. They don't have the same behaviors that we do. So the medication is not made for us necessarily. So this is something that we'll be able to do through Precision Healthcare. 
we can develop better treatments for diabetes, which is what we're going to talk about tonight. And it affects almost 10% of Americans. And that, that is something that can be prevented altogether. It can also talk to us how to slow or even stop different kinds of dementia. The All of Us Research Program is an ambitious effort to gather health information from 1 million or more people across the US. Researchers will be able to use this information to uncover new, more precise ways to prevent and treat disease and to keep people healthy. If we delve deeper into where we live, what we consume, what we do, that will have an impact on trying to prevent diseases in the future. Precision medicine will allow us to get the right medicine at the right time for the right person. Diabetes, high blood pressure, mm -hmm. obesity, illnesses that Black women get and die from need to be researched. This isn't going to be some sort of Tuskegee experiment. This is going to be the community working together with healthcare institutions You have heard from providers and community leaders and members about why this program is important. Now, let's address what the program offers its participants. All of us offers promise in combating disease for us now and for future generations. It provides an opportunity to learn about your health. It allows access to your own data, promotes inclusion of the community in studies that fuel advances in medicine, and it opens up opportunities for participants to learn more about other research studies. With all of these advantages, I am sure you will agree that the All of Us Research Program promotes a positive change in research. The website listed on this slide, researchallofus.org, will bring you All of Us Research. It's a hub where you can view some of the data that has already been collected. At this time, I'd like to recognize our healthcare provider organization, which is the University of Miami. They're the Southeast Enrollment Center. In just a minute, you'll hear from our representative that we have from here, which is Justin Arche. You'll also hear from our presenting partner tonight. That is the Dade County Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Ms. Tony Gillum Harrison, as well as Ms. Karen Love. She is the president of the Top Ladies of Distinction Miami chapter. We're going to start out first, though, with Mr. Arche. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. Um, again, uh, my name is Julian Arche. I'm from the University of Miami. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to speak to you all tonight about a um, little bit about the All of Us Research Program. Um, so yes, um, as was mentioned earlier, we're part of the Southeast Enrollment Center, which um, is made up of the University of Miami here, um, Emory, Morehouse, and the University of Florida um, up in Gainesville. Um, so yeah, the University of Miami is, um, we're like, we're very happy to be part of the research program. And we were chosen specifically as a location because of the, the diversity that um, Miami has from populations, people from populations all around the world and um, particularly the um, African-American and Black communities. Um, so yeah, it's the All of Us Research Program. It's funded by the NIH and it's actually the biggest research grant the University of Miami has ever had. So it's, it's a really big deal to us and um, we're just, we're really happy to be able to participate in this and bring in people from all sorts of different communities and hopefully reach our goal, which is signing up 1 million people nationwide and um, the, the reason why that, million, that number of a million was set is to just kind of encapsulate as many people as possible from not only different genetic backgrounds, but different environmental backgrounds, just, um, you know, based on whether, you know, you grew up with a family of maybe, you know, six people in the house or a family of three, or, you know, you live one mile away from the grocery store or six, um, just all those things um, end up playing a role in how your health um, shapes out. You know, whether you walk a lot or you drive to, you know, over an hour to work or something like that. Um, and all those things um, are factors in our healthcare. And um, the All of Us Research Program is trying to figure out how all of that affects us with, the, again, the ultimate goal of precision medicine. 
So um, yes, the precision medicine, it's really kind of like taking the approach of going against the approach of one size fits all. And really it's just trying to tailor medicine in every single way to, to every person. Um, you know, like whether that be, you know, taking different doses based on your temperature or just, um, you know, whatever, if you grew up in an area with like, you know, like dense air, like smog and things like that, that, you know, certain medicines um, might affect you differently. And just kind of like breaking the chain of getting um, into like medicines where you get into, or your doctor might prescribe you something and then you need another prescription to deal with the side effects of what you were originally prescribed. And then you just get on the chain of being on multiple different drugs and maybe the original one never even solved the, the first issue that you came to the doctor for. So um, the All of Us Research Program is really trying to kind of nip that in the bud and solve the issues from the start and tailor medicine to, to everyone. And uh, part of that is um, bringing in people from the African-American Black community, the Hispanic community, all the underrepresented populations, because typically healthcare research is, um, in the past has been done on people that don't really look like us. Um, it's mostly people that are um, from European descent. So the you know medicine, although it might not be intentional, has been geared towards those populations just because that's where the data is. So um, the more data that um, people from minority groups are able to provide, um, it might help you in your lifetime and it'll certainly help people in future lifetimes. So it's really just, it's about um, like helping yourself and then your kids and their kids. Um, and so that's um, one of like the best parts of this program is that it really will change medicine moving forward. Um, yeah, and uh, so again, just um, the, being in Miami was just a great location for this program. Um, just because of the diverse population we have. And um, we're hopefully we'll end up reaching our goal nationwide of signing up a million people and furthering medicine and changing it forever. Thank you very much for being with us, Julian Arche. Next, do we have Ms. Karen Love? Is she available? One of the... Team and I just wanted to add, I will share a link in the chat right now. Sorry, I just saw your message right now. So yeah, um, I'll share a link in the chat just so you can fill out a contact card. And um, once you fill that out, we'll get in touch with you about how you can sign up. Um, we have a location to sign up at the University of Miami Hospital downtown in Miami and Jackson Hospital as well, which is pretty much right around the corner. And um, yeah, we're looking to open up other locations in the future, maybe in the area, but um. It's not always it's not always that easy because um, we have a turnaround time of about a day or two before we get our blood samples and such sent off to our national biobank. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it's very it's we can, we, have, we are limited to those sign up locations. Perfect. Thank you so much, Julian. And now, thank you for joining us, Miss Karen Love. She is the president of the Miami chapter of Top Ladies of Distinction. Karen, tell us a little bit about what you all are doing. Okay, there you go. Good evening, everyone. To Lakeisha Morris Monroe, the new city of Miami, coordinator, citywide coordinator, and your committee, to the panelists, top ladies, top teens, guests, welcome. I am Karen Love, Top Ladies of Distinction, Miami Chapter President. Top Ladies is also known as TLOD. TLOD was founded in Tyler, Texas in 1964 by eight amazing women. And we are blessed to have our only living founder who celebrated her 98th birthday on November the 7th. We are honored and blessed to have her with us. The Miami chapter was chartered in 1975, and I am honored to serve as the 13th chapter president. Our five programmatic thrusts are top teens of America, and without teens, we do not exist. We also have um, senior citizens, community partnership, which we are partnering with DREF and we are honored to do that, and status of women. We have several activities that for the month of November that we will be participating in. 
And one is, is our Thanksgiving basket giveaway to our senior community. We, be, we will be distributing baskets with the full meal for them to prepare. It will have all the fixings, a turkey and a ham, again, to our senior, community, um, senior citizen community. Also, we will serve our very own. Due to that, we have a lot of older members who are home alone, who don't have members close at hand um, for them to celebrate the holiday. We will prepare hot cooked meals and we will deliver them to our senior members on Thanksgiving day. And also on tomorrow on Veterans Day, we will be distributing snack packs to the homeless and veterans at the, at the Camilla's house. And our partnership with these activities is Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Sigma Alpha Chapter, the City of Miami, Mayor Suarez's office with the farm share, Metropolitan Dade County Section of National Council of Negro Women, the National Association of Black Social Workers, and the National Sorority of Phi Delta Kappa, Phi Delta Kappa, Kappa, I'm sorry, Incorporated Gamma Omicron Chapter. And our activities for December, which we are so excited. Like I told you, we can't operate without our teens. We will be inducting 22 teens in December and we're very excited about that. So you all can follow us on Instagram or Facebook. I'll put the, the chat in, our, in the group. And also, if you would like to know more about Top Ladies, you can go on our national website. I will post that as well in the chat. And I would like to thank you, Ms. Lakeisha, for allowing me this opportunity. It's a pleasure to partner with you. Thank you for being with us tonight and congratulations on inducting 22 top teams. Thank you. There was a comment in the chat from Ms. Michelle Pinckney White. She was asking, have you reached out to local churches? She would like to forward your information to her church. Feel free to engage with her directly. Okay, I will. And next up, do we have Ms. Gillian Harrison on the line? Okay, I don't see her on yet. If there are any representatives from the Dade chapter of Miami alumni, I'm sorry, Dade chapter of Miami alumni, I'm thinking about my people. <laughs> the Dade chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, please direct um, chat me and let me know if you all would like to have something to say to represent the date chapter, um, the date alumni chapter. Thank you again to our healthcare provider as well as tonight's presenting partners. Now, this is a time where you all can begin to engage with us. You'll see a link on your screen. If you have your phone with you, feel free to scan that QR code. We'll also drop a link in the chat for you all. That's where you can get more information about tonight and how to enroll into DREF. You can also make sure to engage with us on our social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and even LinkedIn. So you can find us there as well. Stay tuned. We've been in this virtual environment for over a year now, but we are about to go in person. We'll have a pop-up clinic coming up, so please stay tuned with us and see if we're coming to a neighborhood near you. Again, I am your citywide coordinator, Lakeisha Morris Moreau. My email address is on the screen. Please feel free to reach out to me. And also don't forget to go visit that website. Before we shift into our presentation for tonight, I must give our disclaimer. Let me clear my throat. <clears throat> the views and opinions expressed by the guest panelists and or presenters do not reflect the views or opinions of the Delta Research and Educational Foundation, DREF. DREF Research Matters for All of Us, the NIH All of Us Research Program, or any of these organizations affiliates. To learn more about the NIH All of Us Research Program, visit www.joinallofus.org forward slash DREF. And now, it is my distinguished pleasure to welcome Stacy Santos. 
Stacy is a dear friend of mine, and I would not want to share this moment with anyone but her. She is so special and dear to me. She is a MBA, an MS, a registered nurse, a nurse executive board certified, commanding 7457 Medical Operational Readiness Unit. I don't even know what some of those things stand for, but what it adds up to is she is a boss. She is also all things, she knows all things about health. She's the one that can call us, that we can call on her when we have something going on, an ache here or ache there, and she'll talk to us. And she's always mindful and has an eye on us. Tonight, she's going to talk to us about diabetes, how we can be aware of it and how we can get it under control. And with that, I welcome Stacy Santos. Thank you so, so much, um, my, my dear uh, line sister and Sora, congratulations on your new appointment. Um, I echo and share, she is near and dear to my heart all day, every day. So it's my pleasure to be here. Um, and thank you also to um, my line sister and Sora, to me as well, she's here as well. Love you and, uh, and miss you and all the committee members that are here tonight um, to uh, acknowledge our, um, Diabetes Awareness Month um, and to take uh, time out, all of you for attending today, um, to take time out so that we can have um, a discussion um, about diabetes um, and how this specifically um, affects us um, as people of color and in our communities um, and how we can uh, be better prepared to uh, meet the challenge of conquering diabetes and uh, in our communities and for ourselves. Um, because we, we typically call it the silent killer because many times we don't even know that we have it. Um, before I get into the, uh, the first slide, um, I also wanna welcome my daughter, Mina Santos. She's on from LA um, and I uh, love and appreciate her for attending as well. Um, near and dear to our heart, um, my, my mother, um, so Mina's grandmother, she passed away um, due to complications related to diabetes. That's a big statement, right? Um, what does that mean exactly? Um, so the topic is near and dear to my heart, um, not only as a healthcare professional, but personally, because um, this silent killer um, was working its, um, its devastating consequences uh, in my own mother in ways that we had no idea. And it was masked so, uh, it was so well masked because um, she was relatively healthy otherwise that even though she was, in, um, if she was in treatment, she had insulin, she checked her blood sugar religiously, um, didn't probably eat the best, which we will all, uh, we can all claim uh, a fame to that. Um, but she was actually monitoring her blood sugar religiously. And because um, she was doing so, thought that she was on the right track. Well, it turned out that she was going into uh, multi system type um, organ failures, particularly with her kidney, her liver. Um, and a metabolic crisis um, started to ensue in my medical professionals, she had gnashed. So um, it was very sad to watch um, because she was down um, in a diabetic coma too low, too long. And the, the, I was not with her at the time. Um, and the people around her did not know the symptoms, the signs specifically to know that there was a problem. And so we lost my mother in 2016 um, after a very lengthy battle um, with uh, surviving that diabetic coma. And then resultant was, you know, her quality of life was no more. So one day she was like, you and I probably more energy than you and I and most of us in here put together. And the next day she was not. And then um, subsequently about a year and a half after that, she passed. So it is so important. I cannot stress enough that we are aware of uh, this illness and that we don't wait until we are at the age when the blood sugar results start getting high, that we are already starting to address this 
while we are healthy so that we can stay healthy and that we educate our family members as well um, about our illness and uh, illness and diabetes if we have it um, and that we educate people to know, hey, this is what's going on or what can go on because the more people that know, the more that can intervene and can prevent things that just really should not happen. Um, if you have people around you, there's no reason any person, if they are diabetic, um, should be down too low for too long. So we'll, we'll um, I wanted to say that because I think it's important for people to know that diet, we, we take it for granted. Oh, if I get the, the, if I have the sugar, I can treat it, have, take the insulin and I'm on insulin, I'll be okay. No, that's not true. Um, so with that, um, thank you for indulging me, but I did want people to know this is the second um, year that I've done this presentation. Um, and I wanted to build a little bit more clinically on the concepts we discussed last, but I also wanted to um, keep it practical so people can leave um, with a layman's knowledge of what can I do to prevent this in myself and help others around me as well. Um, so that said, uh, the chat is also um, available for any questions. Um, I'll continue with the, I'm gonna go through the presentation and then it'd be my recommendation um, that we save the questions until the end of the presentation. So please feel free to populate those in the chat and then I'll go through and answer questions that people may have. And we have many professionals um, in this venue tonight who have answers that I may not have. So, or, or people who are, uh, may have personal experiences. So please feel free to, um, to add to the discussion so that it's more robust and benefits us all um, as much as we can in this time we're together. So why are we concerned about diabetes? Um, it's the seventh uh, leading cause of death in the United States. So who would think seventh leading? That's, that's pretty high. Um, so that's important to us. It's the number one cause of kidney failure, lower limb amputations, and adult blindness. Okay, so um, we, uh, if we do not prevent uh, the complications of diabetes, first we wanna prevent it, period. But if we don't prevent the complications, those are all uh, life altering disabilities that then ensue with a whole other set of um, social, economic, uh, personal, self-esteem, community involvement, you really begin to cripple us as a community um, once you start crippling us in our health to the point where we can't move about, we can't get out of the house. Now we're in dialysis because our kidney's failing. That's time we could be out doing other things, helping each other, um, working, contributing to the community and each other and our families. Um, adult blindness, huge. Um, you know, you can't see, that is just an entirely other conversation um, of how do you deal with that and then access those resources as well to help you function, particularly if you live alone and don't have family members to assist you. 34.2 million US adults have diabetes and one in five of them don't even know that they have it. So as we look at these, the statistics, People are walking around without knowledge that either they're pre-diabetic or that they already have diabetes um, and they're not receiving any treatment, no intervention, have no idea, which back to bullet point two, this is where, where we will find them in, in years to come. And it really doesn't take long. If, if you are in a, in a diabetic condition for um, a period of time, for these things to start, they're very insidious. They start to creep up on you. Um, and then before you know it, you have a blue toe, you have a blue foot. You don't know what's going on. Now you need an amputation. Now they can't recoup your circulation. So now you may need above the knee amputation. Now you may need, you know, so it's, it's so complex. And yet I think when we say I've got the sugar, we take that for granted. So we wanna be aware that it's, it's extremely important. These are general statistics. Um, I spent a lot of time, in the last presentation I did, I talked a lot about the, st the uh, statistical um, consequences in our populations. The data at COVID has really put a halt on a lot of the data collection 
And the data had not been updated since um, 2018, which was the last data that I had. Um, and so I didn't see any particular relevance to share. It's pretty you know, outdated from my standpoint. Um, however, uh, just know that it was approximately, it was almost double actually um, in certain populations at the time that that data was collected in 2018 that we as uh, people of color in the minority communities um, experience the ramifications of uh, diabetic illnesses and diabetic related illnesses. Next slide, please. What is diabetes? Um, diabetes simply stated is you have, you have sugar, too much sugar that's, that's circulating that you can't manage. However, the definition is it's a chronic, so that means it's long lasting. So once you have it, you will have it. Um, and so the question becomes how long, long lasting. It's chronic long lasting condition that affects how your body turns food into energy, causes kidney disease, heart disease, and vision loss. That was the official definition through the Centers of Disease Control in 2020. Um, the types of diabetes, we have type one, type two, and uh, may come more be less known um, commonly gestational, um, which is related to pregnancy. Um, and we will uh, talk about those on the next slide. Type one diabetes. It's an autoimmune reaction. So the body attacks itself by mistake, essentially, is what that means, and stops your body from making insulin. Now, I, I, I remember learning for the first time years ago that diabetes was an autoimmune reaction. And I was like, wow, that's, you know, I didn't even look at it that way as many years ago in my practice. Um, and, you know, we really need to look at it that way, because if you think of the fact that it's an autoimmune response, it brings with it a whole other litany of concerns that will accompany it, which of course, in our current climate, particularly with COVID-19, anything to do with immunity is accentuated when it comes to um, co immune issues that you might have from a health standpoint, puts you in a, at a great risk with um, COVID-19 and other illnesses. So we really have to remember that diabetes is, has to do with your immune system. Um, so your body is, uh, it's, it's attacking itself by mistake. It doesn't mean to do that, but it does. Approximately five to 10% of the people who have diabetes have type one. Um, it is usually diagnosed in children's, teens, and adults. If you have type one diabetes, you'll need to take insulin every day to survive. Currently, no one knows how to prevent type one diabetes. Um, and that came from the American Diabetes Association 2020. Um, I cite the slides at the bottom so that if you, um, and I will have links at the end so that if you wanna go ahead and look at more research, you can certainly do that. So although it's generally, that's generally uh, used to be called juvenile diabetes, like that's when that would be um, uh, diagnosed, um, you, that's, you'll, you will have to be on insulin. So that's a little bit different than type two diabetes. Um, in type two diabetes, your body doesn't use insulin well and can't keep your blood sugar at normal levels. Insulin is the hormone that moves the, the, the sugar um, around so, if, if, so that you can use this as energy. So if that's not happening properly and that insulin stays in the bloodstream, that's when it gets high. And that's why you check your blood sugar by pricking your finger. It's in your blood, it's high because the, the sugar molecules, the sugar particles are not moving as they should and they build up. So if you don't have insulin or you can't use it the way you're supposed to, that's why you can't manage your blood sugar properly. About 90 to 95% of people with diabetes have type two. So we're looking, this is the group, right? This is, you have that one to 5%, typically the juvenile group, meaning young, adult, young adults, teens, children, et cetera. Um, that's that one to five, but in 90 to 95% of people, um, this, this can be modified. So type two develops over many years. It's usually diagnosed in adults, but more and more in children, teens, and young adults, because 
our young adult children and teen population are seeing higher incidences of obesity. Why are they seeing higher incidences of obesity? Uh, it can be things such as simple as uh, food is expensive. Okay, so we have this, this gets very simple, right? Um, food is expensive. A lot of times in our communities, people either may not have access, transportation, can't get, um, don't have the education or knowledge to eat differently. Um, and then great, you get that knowledge and then you can't even afford to buy the things that are actually going to turn this around. And, you know, I, we traditionally as a culture, our foods are not friendly. The only thing that I eat in my culture that's friendly to my body and diabetes is probably collard greens. So let's just be real. We eat things that are not conducive to our healthy eating and lifestyle. And so over the years, over the years, over the years, um, and our culture, our cultures um, revolve around uh, our table. Okay, so we sit at Sunday dinner, that's where we gather, that's where we eat, that's where we have a good time, that's where we bond, that's what we, our breaking bread and literally bread, which is probably one of the worst things, and um, you know, I, I could eat bread all day, but um, that is a, such a deep part of our culture. So how do we, how do we turn this around is you know, really the conversation that we have. Because if 90 to 95% of people have type two diabetes, and it develops over the years, we can impact that 90 to 95%. And that really could turn around, turn this bus around um, quite a bit. Um, you may not notice any symptoms, so it's important to get your blood sugar tested. If you think that you are at risk, um, we're all at risk. Let's just be real. We can sit here and list um, all of these. If you're genetics, we all know that we all have somebody in our family, even one who's closely connected that is a diabetic, period, end of story. So don't even bother with that. You're at risk if you don't eat, if you eat rice and if you eat uh, breads and if you do a lot of carbohydrates and you're um, in sweets and all these great things, we all do that. So we're at risk. We're, we don't, if you don't exercise, you're at risk. We don't exercise, most of us not enough. I'm sure there are people here who do. Um, and unless the army makes me, I don't either. Um, so we are at risk. So no need to look at all that because we already know we are. Um, type two diabetes can be prevented or delayed with healthy uh, lifestyle changes, such as losing weight, eating healthy food and being active. Next slide, please. Gestational diabetes, I wanted to mention it just because um, it does it does come up. It's out there. Um, people may um, find that they are um, exposed to learn, having to learn about this when you are pregnant and you end up being a diabetic and you're like, oh my goodness, what's going on? But um, developed some pregnant women who've never had diabetes, so it's a brand new. It usually goes away after your baby is born, but increases your risk for type two diabetes later in life. That is probably the most important notation. So once you've been a gestational diabetic, your risk now increases to become a diabetic. And your baby is more likely um, to have obesity as a child or teen is more likely to, to develop type two diabetes later in life too, which would have much to do with the genetic component of that. Um, and, you know, in that now that that's being um, inherited by them. So um, definitely if you've ever had gestational diabetes and there may be people in this group who have, you definitely want to maintain because it's not, it's not necessarily gone. And that's the important message on this slide. It's not necessarily gone. So you still want to be mindful um, as you move through your life to be um, conscious of those things uh, that you can do in order to uh, prevent type two from developing. Next slide. In the United States, so let's talk about prediabetes. This is the big one. People want to know, oh, like when am I getting close? You know, I was like this couple, a couple years ago, three years ago, uh, four years ago, six years. I get like this, right? So if you don't keep on it, it will come back. You will be prediabetic. Um, and I was like, oh, oh, wait a minute now. I'm not going to be here. Some doctor said, oh, we was in the army in the physical. Oh, we can put you on met. No, you will not be doing that. I can, I can eat differently. I can exercise. Um, and so, yeah, we won't be doing that. Um, and, and I'm grateful that I was able to, uh, to get everything lowered and, uh, and not be on any medication at this point. Um, in the United States, 88 million adults, more than one in three have prediabetes. 84% of them have no idea that they have it. 
with prediabetes, the blood sugar levels are higher than normal, but not high enough to be diagnosed as a formal diabetic. It raises your risk for type two diabetes, heart disease, and stroke. And if your blood sugar, when you go to the doctor and you can ask if they take it, or if you go to a free screening, 100 to 125 indicates that you have prediabetes. And that is, um, that is absolutely um, accurate. Um, I know for the military, I was, I was 99 and I was considered to be over. So um, just be mindful of that uh, as you're sort of in your head, hey, if I'm over 100 and that's easy to remember, I need to be thinking about doing something differently. Next slide. So how do we prevent diabetes? Um, it's really simple. I mean, it's simple, right, on this slide, but it's not simple when we're trying to do it. Um, diet, exercise, and monitor, really. I mean, those to, the diet and the exercise are the three things. And then um, people are not, we're, if we're not diabetics, we're not walking around with a glucometer. You see the picture that I put, they're checking the blood sugar. But you want to make sure that if uh, you are keeping up with your regular um, checkups, um, and I have some free clinic information at the end of the slide for those who may not have providers um, and or um, you know, resources from an insurance standpoint, um, et cetera, that you may, uh, or finances that you may want to share with folks. So that'll be at the end, but normal would be 80 to hundred pre-diabetic. They're saying 101 to 125. So anything over hundred and then diabetic is 126 and up. That's not high. So when I, when I learned that, you know, that's really 126, I would be like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm okay. I'm doing all right. No, that's not okay. So you want to be mindful of that. And uh, if you have any, um, and I'll, I'll interject this because I did not do a slide on, on symptoms. We did do it in the Kahoot, but um, three symptoms, uh, excessive thirst, excessive hunger, and excessive urination. Um, and there are clinical terms for that, but that's irrelevant. We need to know the lay terms. Um, so excessive thirst, excessive hunger, and excessive urination. And you will notice the difference. Um, if you have those, those three classic symptoms, you probably want to go ahead and try to get yourself checked, um, your blood sugar. Next slide. So I brought this out in the presentation I did last year, and I had to bring it out again because, um, A, the audience is different and you don't know who may have seen it or not, but it helps me. Um, I, I absolutely love the plate method, um, because we don't have time. Let's just all be real. I mean, some do, but I really don't have time for um, calorie counting and this and that. And, oh, I have to do this and that and the other. And um, when you try to do it with a busy life, it gets in the way um, of, of many things. I had that experience recently and it was a disaster because here I am trying to eat this way, eat that way, do this, do that, figure this out and that. And I'm obsessed over it. And it just becomes a burden. So what can we do to keep it simple? So as you're cooking your foods um, and thinking about what to buy for your foods and how to eat for your foods, and you know that's probably the biggest conversation, but in simple, um, half of your plate should be veggies. Think green. Um, yes, you can have some orange and yellow, but you don't want all carrots that's starch that's gonna break down into sugar. That's not what we're trying to do here. So the more green you have on your plate, the better you are. So if you took your plate and divided it this way, you'd have mostly green and vegetables on, uh, on the, the half. And there's a picture of an avocado, great food, love it. It's, it's outstanding and it's very, very healthy. So if you're looking for something quick, you can throw in a bag, you know, cut, eat, take on, on the move. Um, that's uh, raw kale. If you like doing that, you can rinse that and throw it in a bag. I mean, there's things, a lot of options, but um, that would be half. The other quarter would be grains, um, brown rice, grain pasta, which is out there now everywhere, which I think is great because I love pasta and I'm sure many of us do, but um, the brown pastas, the, the multi-grain that they make now, that's actually much better for you. And then the other quarter of the plate should be lean protein. So fish, chicken, and lean meats, you know, fish and chicken are always the best. Keep the red meat low, but you, you can eat that. And, and pork is actually not too bad if you eat it. Not everybody eats it, but these are just suggestions. Uh, next slide. Exercise. 
anything, anything you can do. Um, walk, run, weights, uh, you know, if you have hand weights, biking, yoga, rowing, swimming, sports, anything to stay active. The easiest thing for everyone to do is walk. If you don't have treadmills, you don't have a bike, you hate yoga, you're like, I am not rowing and I don't swim. Okay, so you just eliminated everything. But I will tell you what, and you don't run because you're like, no, we can't be running. That's a lot. We walk, you, you can walk. So I recommend that you get a walking partner and start by walking around your block, walking a certain distance, you know, that you may or may not do um, in, a, in a, a regular route um, and do that consistently. But I mean, if you just walked a mile a day or even three times a week and you did a mile, you would be having an impact on your, uh, on your health. If you don't like distance, because that overwhelms you, that overwhelms me when I'm trying to run, do time. So, you know what, I only have 15 minutes to dedicate to this. And please, if we don't have 15 minutes to dedicate to our health, I'm preaching to myself right now, right? Then we have a problem because if we don't take care of this problem, we are not gonna be here to enjoy our life eventually. And the life that we do have will be compromised. So a simple walk, throw on some sneakers, I wear Crocs, as everybody knows. Uh, I'll do walk in Crocs if I have to, um, or my uh, slides. But put something comfortable on for shoes. You don't need workout gear. You don't need to change. If you work in scrubs, if you're healthcare, you wear a uniform, you can stay in it and walk and keep it pushing. Try to do something. It makes a huge difference. And it doesn't have to be big. 15 minutes gets that heart rate going, gets that exercise on, and you're you're burning off energy, which means you're burning off sugar. Next slide. Um, so I did want to put a quick slide about diabetes and COVID-19. Um, there's a link um, through Mayo Clinic at the bottom um, for, uh, for anyone who would like to access it. Um, we can always copy it into the chat um, if people want to look at that. Um, Mayo Clinic has great resources, and then that'll link you to their site as well for anything else you might need. Um, two things make di diabetes and COVID-19 an absolutely um, horrendous and fearful complication, and that's inflammation and poor circulation. So COVID-19, the, the, the two big issues have to do with the inflammation um, in, in all of your tissues, but particularly in your lungs. And then just to keep it simple, let's just try to keep this, you know, so that people can track um, and then poor circulation. So we all hear about the blood clots and et cetera. So there's a whole, those are the two things. There's a whole bucket of information and research around these two pieces with COVID-19. They are issues with diabetes, which is why the poor circulation ensues and you have amputations, which we talked about earlier, of toes, um, lower limb, mean feet, above the knee and then sometimes at the thighs, at the, uh, at the hip, you know? So as the as circulation doesn't improve, the tissue dies and you have to um, remove the, the limb. So these two things make COVID-19 just, that is nothing that a diabetic wants to be near. My personal preference, you know, and I always, I will always say this disclaimer, you need to follow up with your healthcare provider. However, um, it is recommended, the vaccine is recommended. Um, and again, you, you, that's the general recommendation and you will find that when you click the link here. Um, but you certainly want to take that up with your healthcare provider because they know your unique circumstances and any other conditions that you may have that would make, uh, preclude you from receiving that vaccine. So, um, I myself am vaccinated. I have a vaccination and booster so that, that I'm healthy otherwise. And that was my choice. Um, but please feel free to go to the link and they, that can give you more clinical detailed information um, if you're seeking that. Um, but we certainly um, stay masked up. That's all, that's all I can say about COVID-19 um, because the masks do help and they do work. I know people who've had no vaccinations and never had COVID. And it's strictly because they um, wash their hands and wear their mask. So that was my COVID plug. Online resources, I did wanna put um, some resources and um, try to keep it robust. I'll leave that up to, um, to the moderators, how they want to, if they wanna put this in the, in the chat um, or share the slide, whatever works. Um, 
but uh, online resources with the uh, Minority Health HHS, that's where you can get a lot of data. So if there's new data that comes out, um, diabetes.org, that's the diabetes community, local offices, diabetes association, that's what that's about. Um, your local offices in Florida, there's a link to that. Um, diabetes and um, coronavirus, there's that. And then I also have a link with free clinics um, in Miami particularly, um, I'm in Jacksonville currently, um, so, but the, we're geared um, to our Miami area. But additionally, I put the um, American Diabetes, Diabetes Association of Florida, um, and you can reach out to them by phone or on their website, by email, mail, um, whatever works. They can uh, give you more information about support groups, uh, groups that are linked up. There's tons of things going on virtually still now that people have really recognized this platform during the pandemic um, in order to get information out to folks. But I thought the free clinic site was really helpful because like it or not, um, there are periods when we, I, there have been periods when I've not had insurance and I've been a nurse for 27 years. Um, so, and in the military for part of it, but I've had periods of time where I've not had health insurance. So um, I always want to put that there because people say, that's great, Stacy, but I can't get to a clinic. I don't have insurance. Where do I go? I don't have insurance. There are a list of free clinics. And if you are, um, if you have income at all, they'll slide scale. And if you have no income, then they'll work with you to, uh, to provide services to you. Next slide. I think it's the question slide. Yeah. So thank you. Um, I appreciate everyone's time and attention. I went a little bit over than what I thought, but um, it's really important to me that, as I told you, the topic is near and dear to my heart. And I want us all to um, be healthy uh, and be able to enjoy uh, our, ourselves, our families, um, our loved ones, our friends, our sores, our children, our parents, everyone. It's just, it's just so important. So thank you everyone. And I'm certainly open to questions. Thank you. Thank you for being with us tonight. Do we have any questions? Please feel free. Don't be shy. Put your questions in the chat so that we can make sure that we get those questions answered. You have someone here that has a wealth of knowledge and information. I also like to um, thank the other healthcare professionals that are here. If you are a healthcare professional, please make sure that you chat so that we can make sure that we acknowledge you as well. We thank you for your service. This has been a rough but what are we going on two years of the COVID pandemic so you all have been right there in the thick of it all thank you Alicia Bethel we have her she is one of our nurses down here in Miami and a member of our Miami team thank you very much I think I also saw um, Cheryl uh, TV Alicia say like you were speaking well, we have a question for, for right. Stacy that came to me in a question I placed in the chat. Stacy, can you tell us a little bit about the hemoglobin A1C? I can. Um, it's actually, um, it's, it's a controversial metric right now, which was kind of news to me. Um, it, base, it actually is uh, more, it's a measurement um, over time um, of your, uh, of the, the um, how your body is um, manipulating the blood sugar. So as opposed to getting a one-time snippet shot and any of my other healthcare providers who can make a better explanation of this, um, please feel free to chime in because I know there's several of you in here who are quite expert. Um, the, the blood sugar that you get when you do a fasting, so when you get up and you fast and you go, that's just like one moment in time. If you were to take a blood sugar and you didn't fast, that's just like right at that moment based on what you're, um, what you're eating and what your day was like and that sort of thing. But a hemoglobin A1C um, actually gives you a good look over time. So it's, real, it's, it's generally speaking in my experience um, and up until some recent research that I was reading as I was doing this presentation, um, it's, it's very accurate um, because it gives you more of a time span versus this one snippet in time. Um, so that's something that, as far as I know, um, I don't know if anyone else wants to comment that we're still using um, in, the, in the profession. I don't work in a clinic or on the floors anymore, but um, that we're using as a measure um, to see 
uh, where you stand as far as being uh, pre-diabetic um, or diabetic. They usually like to see it under six. So right. if you um, if you're anywhere over that, then you're getting into territory uh, that you don't want to be in. All right. So Stacy, I would like to add the hemoglobin A1C does measure your blood glucose level over about a three month period of time. I didn't know this as a young nurse, and I thought that this was it was very fascinating because my grandma would eat good maybe two days before her doctor's appointment. Mm. And once her labs came back through the roof, she was wondering what happened. Mm. And I said, Grandma, you've been cheating for the last three months. You can't not cheat for, for a day and expect those labs to be in order. Right. So we had to really do a lot of education and teaching to Grandma. So Grandma began to learn how to eat healthy on a regular basis. So Grandma kind of stopped cheating. And grandma lived a, a very healthy and pro, um, productive, oh, productive life. But grandma was cheating and the doctor knew grandma was cheating because that A1C told the story. Mm -hmm. So don't cheat. We also have a hand raise from Miss Michelle Pinkney White. Hi, good evening, Soros. Um, thank you so much, Sara Lakeisha and Sara Santos for giving this presentation. Uh, it's awesome and it's near and dear to my heart as well. Um, as a pharmaceutical sales representative, I have uh, dealt in both all these disease states and especially in diabetes for over eight years. So I've sold a lot of diabetic products, but also my mother-in-law was an end-stage renal patient um, who was on dialysis for 14 years. And um, it's, it's very tiring and taxing, not only on the patient, on our healthcare system, but on family members as well. Um, and you, of course, she had end stage from having diabetes and hypertension. And we didn't even know that she was a diabetic and almost went into a diabetic coma on us one day. And we had no idea because she was hiding it from the family and she was a nurse. And so that happens a lot in our communities, but I think it's very befitting that mm -hmm. we had the NIH presentation along with having this diabetes presentation because uh, a lot of the medications that I have represented over the years uh, in diabetes, we are a nominal amount of persons represented in clinical trials. And I know that it comes from back in the 40s and the 50s, the Tuskegee trials and what was done to gentlemen in Mississippi's. But as we've learned in um, you know, current years that we have to be represented because we need to know how these medications work in our system. And a lot of times we don't. And there are side effects that occur in people of color that don't occur in our counterparts, which a lot of people don't realize. Like uh, in the medication I represent right now, angioedema. Yes. Angioedema yes. occurs in African-Americans and it does not occur as much in our Caucasian counterparts, you'll see it in Hispanics and African-Americans. Oh so I just gosh. think that this uh, discussion is very, very important for us to know because we are the, ri the highest rising population uh, in diabetes in the United States, oh. along with hypertension and hypocholesterolemia, which is high cholesterol. And they all are co comorbid conditions. And so, um, you know, thank you so much for this presentation. I think it's something that we all need to be aware of and be conscious of, and also talk to our family members about it because our family members, you know, sometimes they don't want to listen until it's too late. Literally, my mother in law walked into the hospital, and when she came out, she was on dialysis. Mm. And um, dialysis is very taxing on you and taxing on the body. Even those persons who take insulin, you know, who um, you have to watch where you eat when you go out with your friends, you have to watch eating and drinking and all the things that you love to do. Like you said, um, Sara Santos, that it is, we are a communal people and what, what do we do most but to eat? You know, that is where we gather. Um, but when we gather, we have to also watch. The holidays are getting ready to come up. And this is where the increase in hospitalizations come in for diabetic patients uh, during the holiday time. So um, thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, it was thorough and concise. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Captain Sorry. Stacey, one more thing I would like to add. So if we know anyone that has diabetes, there are resources in the community. community. For instance, Walmart, the metformin is free. At Publix, it's $4. If you on insulin, the pharmacist at Walmart can connect you to a drug rep or a drug company to mm -hmm. get you your insulin at a reduced price. If you are not funded, meaning you don't have insurance, you can contact Jackson Health System. They have what's called a Jackson card, mm -hmm. where once you become one of their patients, they will make sure they provide you with the necessary medic medications and you will have access to their doctors. Yes. So there, there are resources in the community. We just have to connect the community to the resources. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Um, Alicia, we have a question from Jackie in the chat. Can you, I think we have two or three questions. Can we um, go over those and then we'll start closing out? Can you see her? Oh, okay. I'm trying to find the question. Um, um, yeah, I'll stand by, please. I see Thank you, Miss Stacy, for, for sharing. Stacey. This is helpful information. I definitely learned a lot about diabetes. This was definitely great. I'll um, share, Alicia. It says a quick question for Miss Stacy for okay. someone like me who works out a lot but love sweets, even though, sorry, scrolling down, even though I haven't eaten some lately, good job, Jackie. What advice um, would you give to someone like me to avoid the risk of diabetes? So, and thank you, Jackie. I appreciate you being here. Um, so yeah, sweets. What do we, what's there to say about that? So working out is great because you eat these sweets, right? And then you work out. So you say, okay, I cheated, but you know, now I'm working out. So everything's going to balance out. The problem with that is you're only keeping, you're only ma you're barely maintaining, right? And this still takes a toll on the body. Okay. So just as um, it was mentioned earlier that um, the hemoglobin A1C, when, when that's run, because it tells over time what's going on, um, you know, it's, you know, you're kind of cheating, right? You're cheating yourself out of the benefits of your workout, right? So it's always going to be mind over matter. What I usually tell people is what, is what I have to do to myself because sweets is my problem in life, candy, sweets. So, I, I mean, I think everyone, you shouldn't always be depriving yourself every single day of your life because otherwise you'll be binging, right? The next thing you know, you're like me sitting with, the whole thing of gummy bears and you, you, that's it, right? Okay, so that doesn't work. So what I recommend is um, for sweets, um, dark chocolate is actually um, something like the very small ones. Um, Andy's has some, they actually have a lot of diabetic candy out there. So if you look in your candy, if it's candy that you like, or um, there are a lot, tons of recipes that you can make sweets that um, uh, someone made flan for me. They actually made it for me, right? They gave it to me last night. And, um, but it's, it's, it had no sugar in it, if you can believe that. Um, and she's, no, I made this for you because specifically, you know, you can eat this. And I said, oh, I need this recipe. So I would encourage you to look at recipes that um, are for things that you like, but they are specifically tailored for the diabetic. Additionally, if you aren't on the go and you like just candy, like sweets, a lot of the, like I said, Andy's has those, the candies and they're small, it's little chocolate. Dark chocolate is actually the best for you. Um, and I always say eat half, eat half of whatever you have. So if you have a small Andy's chocolate and you break it in half, that's negligible. You've just had a small amount, but you've kind of gotten your fix and you've been able to satisfy. If you want a piece of pie, um, you know, I want to get the biggest piece of pie. No, we're going to get a slither of pie and, you know, give yourself reward. So if you, you know, you work out and you say, okay, the workout comes first, right? So I worked out, I did that today, maybe twice a week on these days, get regimented with it and, and try to hold yourself accountable to that. I'm going to allow myself to have sweets you know, because I get it. And when we're on the move and we don't pack the foods, we don't have the right foods with us. That's me all the time. 
um, you, it is literally me all the time. You go right for what's available and it's never anything healthy. I promise you that. Um, so preparation is important, but don't completely deny yourself. But the I you like to use the half concept. If I was getting this much, I'm going to cut that in half or even a quarter just to give yourself a taste and then keep it pushing. And, uh, and I would designate a couple of days that you can do that. Um, and then only give that to yourself if you've fulfilled your other requirements, if it's working out and you know you've done that and you've been on your schedule, hey, that's your reward. So that, that's how I, I, the only way that I can think to do it because it's mind over matter, because it's sitting in front of you and the chances of you going to it are very high. So when you get to it, that's where you can make the difference right? So if you can't say to yourself, I'm not going to have it and that's it. Okay. I'm going to have it, but I'm going to have less or I'm not going to have it as often. That would be my recommendation, Miss Jackie. Thanks for your question. I think it's a good one. Thank you. We have another question from Ms. Lauren St. Ville. If you are pre-diabetic and make the lifestyle changes you suggested, how long would it take to see that change? So I can give you my personal story um, I was able to start an aggressive program of exercising, eating differently, weight loss, all of that. Um, and it took me about probably, it took me about three months to start seeing things change in a positive, like where I could say, oh, I see results, not just the weight loss, not just, oh, I feel better, but where I could actually go get my blood sugar tested. And I had the military following me. So I had the benefit of going in. And within, I would say three months, I was all, had already dropped. I was like 6.3 in my hemoglobin A1C. They checked it again. And I was like 5.8 or something like that. So I was very regimented. I didn't have wine. I didn't have sweets. I didn't have, I mean, I was like totally regimented, but that was a pretty significant drop. So, and I made the, the blood sugar result because my fasting was 98. So I was able to shift everything around. It took me about three months. Um, so that's a good amount of time, right? That's a quarter. If you look at life in quarters, in one quarter, if you make some, some change, you're going you're gonna to be able to make a positive hit on um, your blood sugar level. So, and I think that's reasonable because if you don't see results, you get demotivated. So we want to be able to, to see that result and say, hey, I'm doing this and it is directly impacting this. That's the beauty of blood sugar. You do this and it directly impacts that. And then you, you will see that progress and that will motivate you to keep going. Captain Stacy, we have a, a good question here and it reads, in regards to COVID and diabetes, when I had COVID, I ended up testing negative after my quarantine period was up. But my dad, who was a diabetic, tested positive multiple times over a period of a month and a half. Is that because his healing was compromised due to his diabetes? So there are a lot of factors related to that. Um, so it's hard to say, but I will tell you this. Um, this certainly, um, the question would be, did he ever really recover, right? And so how, again, COVID, the research on COVID-19, of course, is all new to us in the past several years, but uh, most people will convert to a negative result within, uh, the, within a couple of weeks, right? You may have a lingering, but in a couple of weeks, you can usually test negative, get yourself back to work, and, and if you're feeling okay, and that sort of thing. Um, the question is, did he reinfect? So, you know, did he, did, are we, do we reinfect ourselves? Because as we all know, even to get, um, even for basic common cold and you're trying to keep everything clean and do this and do that and between pillowcases and utensils and doorknobs and all this business, you know, our nurse, so, you know, I'm crazy, but I mean, we do all these things and yet the one thing we miss, right? So you, you can do all that in your house. You can do all this stuff and then, okay, I'm feeling better. I go out and I have a brief time where I'm exposed or I don't have my mask on. And it could be as something as simple as going to the doctor, the, the hospital, the market, it's everywhere. So the question becomes, was he ever, did he ever get, did he ever have a negative 
result at all, number one. The other question I would have is, was the test an antibody test or was it a COVID-19 test? Because if it was an antibody test, that does not mean he had active disease. He will have antibodies for what we hope is a very long time so that it, that will be what protects him from COVID-19 in the future. So that would be my only, and you may be able to answer that, but that may or may not be able to, but that would be my only question. Was it an antibody test and he had positive antibodies, which would be totally appropriate and true. Active disease, absolutely. It's gonna take a long time um, for a diabetic to kick be, um, COVID-19 or any illness mm -hmm. for that matter, because of the, remember, it's an immunocompromised illness. So your immune system is already batting a thousand, which is why when diabetics get the common cold, the flu, they can get hot. You and I can walk around, but they may be hospitalized because they, they, cannot, they cannot functionally attack and eliminate a virus or um, a bacterial illness because their immune system is already compromised. So always thinking in those terms, um, you, you know, it really can help you because if you have a diabetic in your family or yourself and you're, you get the common cold and now you're, they're sick and they're not getting better, go right to that diabetes. That's probably why they're having the problem. So was it an antibody test? That would be my question. Did he reinfect? Could be, or was he ever really, you know, eradicated the illness to begin with because of the diabetes? Certainly possible. Certainly possible. Thank I hope you. that helps. And that was a great question, Shaterka. Um, before you add, Alicia, I just wanted to add to Lauren's um question. Miss mm -hmm. Rolanda Bridgewater posted in the chat that she was pre-diabetic, lost 110 pounds, and after six months was okay. Took longer because she was unable to walk. So that, that was in um, correlation to Lauren St. Ville's question earlier, so I wanted to throw that out there. Thank you, Alicia, you can go ahead. That's awesome. Great work. The, all right, great, excellent work. The previous question, it was a good example of being a diabetic versus a non-diabetic. All healing take place longer in diabetics, period. It's a slower healing process. That's all I want to add. Thank Any you more questions? I think we caught them all. If not, we'll try and when we record this video and put it on Facebook, we'll try and answer them there in the Facebook page. But thank you so much. Please, let's give some hand claps, some hearts, some stickers for <laughs> Stacy Santos for sharing that information. Captain Stacy Santos. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate the welcome and the opportunity to share in, the, in this very um, important um, platform to be able to spend some time with you tonight on these uh, important issues for ourselves and our families. Thank you. Thank you, Sora. Thank you, Sora. Thank you, Captain. My pleasure. As we close citywide coordinator, Lakeisha, I just wanted to say Tony um, Junius, her takeaway was um, that you can have diabetes and not even know it. That's scary. So I feel like that's a good point to end on so people can take it seriously and you know, yes. focus on that help. Exactly, exactly. But before you all leave, we have a couple of things to finish off on. As you know, tonight, Reverend Dr. Kay Dawson was not here. She was at an ordination service for another one of our dear sisters that is being ordained as a minister. So she is there. But not only that, she has been elevated to the role of community engagement coordinator for Drug Research Matters for all of us. Let's give her a hand clap Woo in her absence. She has trained this team well. She has trained me well. I love her dearly. And she is now going from being a citywide coordinator, which is my role now, to being over all of the citywide coordinators from all of the 12 cities that you all saw represented. So she has her work set out for, for her, but if anybody can do it, we know that it is Reverend Dr. Kay Williams Dawson. Again, I am Lakeisha Morris Monroe. I'd like to give love to our home team, Alicia Bethel, Dashwell Irvin, Janine Brian Adderley, Margaret Williams, Serenity Roscoe, Tamia Spells, Zahara Calloway, 
And you saw our presenting partners earlier, the Dade County Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, as well as the Miami Chapter of Top Ladies of Distinction. But we have plenty of community partners. We're so grateful for all of you. If you see your logo represented, please make sure to put in the chat who you're with. Let us know where you're coming from, where you're representing. We appreciate you so much. There will be opportunities as the year goes on for you all to be presenting partners as well. So we'll be reaching out to you. If we have any of the members for those organizations, thank you for being with us. If we have any questions, don't forget also to fill out that survey that's going to be placed into the chat again for you all, the survey for tonight's event. Our next event is on November 24th. We are right here at Zoom, seven o'clock every second and fourth Wednesday night, second and fourth Wednesday night. We're going to be talking about skin care on our next meeting on the 24th. That's right before Thanksgiving. We're going to talk about the pores and we're talking about how they say black does not crack, but sometimes it does and how we can stop it from doing so, all right? So join us on the 24th. Thank you all for being with us tonight. Please enjoy your Wednesday. To all of our veterans that are out there, happy Veterans Day. Thank you for your service. All of our active Army members that are out there or military members that are out there, thank you for your service, Captain Santos, and all of our members of the military that are here with us tonight. Thank you for your service. We appreciate you, and you all have a safe night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.